This video is sponsored by Energy Sage. Visit the link in the description to find local verified solar and heat pump experts in your area, as well as local community projects you can become a part of. Owning an electric vehicle is great, especially if you can charge it at home and benefit from the reduced costs associated with at-home charging when compared to public fast charging. But as many people have said before, how green an EV is depends on where the power you use to charge it comes from and how that power is generated. Many utility companies now offer green tariffs that let you power your home with renewable electricity. Usually this works from the utility company committing to buying or generating the same amount of electricity per month as you use, allowing you to offset the carbon impacts of your home's consumption with renewably generated electricity. And if your home is powered by 100% renewable electricity and your car is charged from the power that your home gets, then... Congratulations, your car's carbon impact is pretty darned low. But what if you could set your home up to charge your electric car using power generated on the roof of your home? Not only would you know exactly where your energy came from, but you'd be doing the electric car equivalent of growing your own vegetables. So today I'm going to explore some options to let you do exactly that. If you have some form of solar generation capabilities at home, there are several different ways that you can charge your car using only power generated on your roof. And they range from simple implementations that might cost you a little more money through to some more nerdy options. And my goal today is to get you looking at the various options available. Let's start with the obvious one energy offsetting. While at-home working is now far more common than it was, many companies, including those who you might hope would know better, are asking people to return to the office and if you are using your electric vehicle to commute, that might put a wrench in your goal of charging your EV from renewable energy at home, especially if it's dark when you leave in the morning or when you return at night. It's not exactly easy charging your car from solar electricity at night time now, is it? I mean, it's now technically possible thanks to some new advancements in solar panels, but not that practical in terms of power output. Except it might be, especially if your home's solar setup is well designed and you generate more power than you use and your utility offers net metering. Just as a refresher, net metering allows homeowners to offset electricity they might consume at night time with energy their solar panels generate during the day. And as long as your solar panels produce more energy at home than your home uses at night time, I'd argue that you're already running your home from renewable electricity and your car, at least on a net metering basis. Of course, there are some limits to net metering and in some parts of the world it's either prohibited completely or particularly difficult or arduous to set up. In other words, your results may vary. This setup is of course the easiest in the long term. It requires very little input from you and it can actually encourage you to be more energy efficient as it can be quite the buzz to get a negative energy bill every month. But next in my list is some form of home energy storage system, be it a Tesla Powerwall or one of the other commercially or DIY available solutions out there. Energy storage systems allow you to store excess power produced by your solar panels during the day and then allow you to retrieve that energy for later use, often at night time. Systems can be grid tied, meaning your battery can pull power from the grid to charge itself up and in some cases feed power back to the grid, which would allow you to earn money or credits if your utility offers net metering. But these systems can also be standalone, meaning that they aren't connected to the electrical grid in any way. 
there are a whole range of different battery storage products now available from the Tesla Powerwall to many more, and they cover a wide range of applications and budgets. But honestly, my favorite ones are DIY builds that repurpose salvage EV battery packs. I am no expert on them, but there are some great channels I'm going to link to below that are and will help you start on that path if you are feeling brave. Of course, DIY storage products may or may not be legal in your area and you may or may not be able to connect them to your home. So check with your local city, county and utility before hooking anything up. That said, at the same time, if you want to operate a completely off-grid charging solution, things are a little easier. You can quite easily set up a DIY solar array with a bank of cheap battery packs and a high quality inverter. Frankly, I'm actually tempted to try something next year along those lines for a couple of electric vehicle projects I'm going to be working on. Basically a simple three or four kilowatt hour array, an appropriately sized mains inverter, some recycled battery packs, and maybe a level one or level two charging station that can output a few kilowatts of power completely off grid for the five or six hours that the vehicles I'm looking at using will need to charge up. Basically a couple of electric scooters and an electric tractor. But given most people are needing a plug and play solution, let's put that to one side and look at the next option for charging your EV using solar power, essentially a smart charging station. Depending on where you live in the world and your level of tech savviness, you can now buy a range of different charging stations for your home that allow you to either power your EV directly from a solar array using direct current or use a back-end integration with your existing solar inverter manufacturer to dynamically adjust vehicle charge rate based on excess solar generation. In Europe, for example, you can buy several different models, including the Zappi EV charger. That one is particularly nifty as it can be set up by the owner to charge when you're producing energy at home, when the grid is producing green energy, or it can be set up just to prioritize vehicle charging when you are in a hurry and need a full battery pack. And in North America, there are a slew of similar products that let you do essentially the same thing. They dynamically adjust the power being sent to your EV based on how much excess energy your solar panels are producing, what the grid's doing, and other factors that you can set up. But what if you don't have an EV charging station that offers integration into your solar panels, or you already have an EV charging station? Fear not, because I'm going to quickly walk you through the process of doing it yourself with a little bit of nerdy home assistant action. But first, let's talk about the thing that you will most certainly need before you can produce solar power at home solar panels. And for that, our video sponsor, Energy Sage, will be able to help you out. Energy Sage offers homeowners the chance to connect with local verified solar installers across the US and now heat pump specialists in select markets who really know their stuff and can help you navigate the process of installing solar panels at home, help you join a community solar program, or help you install a heat pump to green up your heating. I used Energy Sage when we were looking for installers that wanted to help us put solar panels on the roof of our home, and our Energy Sage verified installers were professional, knowledgeable, and put us in touch with an amazing credit union that allowed us to finance our solar panels for as low a monthly payment as possible. So follow the links below to sign up for either of Energy Sage's free no obligation services and get that ball rolling today. If you do choose to use an Energy Sage installer for your project, we here at the channel will get a small referral fee, so you would be helping us out too. Okay, so you've got your solar panels, you've got a charging station, maybe one that's connected to the internet, and you want to be greener about your EV charging habits. So let's see if we can get things playing nicely with Home Assistant. For those who don't know, Home Assistant is a fantastic free 
open source home integration platform that you can run on everything from a Docker container on a server to a single board computer like the Raspberry Pi, the Orange Pi, or my favorite, Le Potato. And I've been using it for many years to make my home a little bit smarter. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of getting Home Assistant running in this video, but I am going to talk you through a basic integration that I've set up for my home. My solar panel inverters are made by Enphase, and luckily there's an open source third party integration for Enphase for Home Assistant that lets me log the power going into my home from my solar panels, both in a given time period and also find out instantaneous power generation. I also happen to have a span drive and two juice boxes, all of which allow me to adjust power output from my charging stations in real time. I also have obviously the Ford Charge Station Pro, which is part of the Ford Home Integration System, and that should theoretically also offer that, but I don't think anybody has reverse engineered it yet. So let's just focus on the juice boxes because they're the most common. While we are going to focus on juice box integration today, I should acknowledge that the Home Assistant Community Store has literally hundreds of other integrations available, some of which are for internet connected charging stations. So depending on where you live in the world, check out the Hacks store to see if your charging station has an integration in Home Assistant. In our particular case, we're going to load JuiceNet, as well as the Enphase Envoy integration and the Electricity Maps integration. I can now use those to control just how and when my EVs plugged into my juice boxes charge. With all of those integrations already set up, I'll link to them in the description below, I just need to head to the Settings tab and then click on Automations and Scenes. Once there, I can click Create Automation and tell the computer to create a new automation based on triggers, conditions and actions. In this case, to keep it simple, I'm going to tell Home Assistant to reduce my charging current on my charging stations to 10 amps if my solar panels are producing less than 4 kilowatts of instantaneous power for a period longer than 5 minutes. I can then save that trigger and it will activate the next time my power generation drops below the set threshold. I can create a twin trigger that does the exact opposite and restores a higher charge current when the panels are producing more electrons. My current trigger uses grid CO2 emissions as well, meaning if the grid is relying too heavily on fossil fuels and has a high carbon footprint, my car will either not charge at all or just charge more slowly. And because Home Assistant is so very much customizable, it is possible to be as granular or as blocky as you want with your charging logic. So there you have it, ways you can charge your EV from solar power and not fossil fuels using the power you're generating on the roof of your home. But I'm curious, there are so many different ways of doing it. So if you have solar charging, how does your system work? Share your setup in the comments below. And on that note, we are done with today's video and thanks again to Energy Sage for sponsoring it. Follow the link below to find out how easy it can be to get verified, trustworthy solar experts helping you make the step towards energy self-sufficiency, either with solar on the roof of your home or through a local community solar project, or in fact, by installing a heat pump. If you have comments, drop us a polite note below in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you are a Patreon supporter in the comments section there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Kofi, Bitcoin and swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server and our Peertube server. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go out to our V2G Patreon supporters. Alan Topper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Esker, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Ray Jean Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Asentar, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlal, Linda I, 
Irish Mike Weeder and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters. They are Paul Conway, Kevin Burbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, CPU Freak 101, Eric Neck, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on this main channel a day earlier if you're a Patreon supporter. Plus on a Sunday, you can find us over on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. As with the last video I filmed here, I have my Pismo G3 PowerBook behind me and a lot of you have reached out to ask if I ever owned any iBooks. I have owned several iBooks over the years. I don't currently own any iBooks, unfortunately. Most of my portables after the PowerBook G3 and also the the really old power books I have. They're all Intel based ones, but I would love to have a clamshell iBook. I had access to one for about six months and I loved using it. I loved playing games on it. I just thought that that particular design was just fun and funky and a little bit different. And frankly, I miss that era of Mac, that transparent Mac that didn't take itself all too seriously. And I've seen some really impressive hacks of those machines over the years, including a G4 powered um, clamshell iBook, which just blows my mind. The iBooks that I did own were ones that I purchased shortly after graduating music school. I had one as a teacher for a while and that particular generation of iBook was notoriously bad. It kept breaking. Uh, so I went from a, I think it was a, a 13 inch iBook to a 15 inch iBook. There was a period where they made two different sizes and one just kept breaking. The graphics cards kept dying and Apple gave me a, a an upgrade as a sorry. And this is before we had Apple stores in the UK. So I got a free upgrade to a newer machine and that kept breaking. So they ended up giving me an upgrade to a G4 PowerBook, which was a huge upgrade from the original iBook that I'd purchased. And they gave me that. And then, then I managed to spill hot chocolate, I think, into the, uh, the G4 PowerBook. And I got a replacement through insurance. And I think my replacement model was actually an Intel machine. Um, and I got that as a replacement. And the insurance company didn't want the old one back. So I gave it to a friend of mine who sold it on eBay with powers on looks good because when you press the power button, everything lit up, uh, but it didn't actually do anything. It just made the ring on the charge port door light up. Um, um, and that was it. I must admit, I feel a bit guilty about that. <laughs>